Hi there, I'm Azim Azar. Welcome to the Exponential View podcast. Now, my guest today, quite a curious cat, a very interesting one, trying to think quite deeply about some complex questions. Now, I don't always agree with some of his conclusions, but I really respect how he thinks about them and how he articulates himself. And this podcast is a venue for that type of generative discussion, the battlefield of ideas. So I'm delighted that he and I can spend some time exploring some of these issues. He's the founder of Conjecture. It's an AI company focused on finding solutions to huge issues that he cares about, that I have talked about on this podcast and in this newsletter for many of the past seven or eight years. How do you build safe, auditable and explainable AI? Connor Leahy, have you got your gloves on? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Now, it's not going to be that combative at all, Connor. That's not my <laughs> style. But I did want to acknowledge that we don't always agree on some of the key trajectories. I guess it was about a year ago that you and 20,000 other people signed the Pause Giant AI Experiments open letter calling for a six-month pause in training AI models that were more capable than GPT-4. And it got a lot of media coverage at the time. That pause didn't happen at all. And we're all still here. So one year later, what did you make of it? So I think the letter basically achieved what I was hoping it would achieve and what I expected it to achieve. I was under no illusion that we could create a global coordinated moratorium without institutional buy-in within six months. This is an extremely difficult thing to do. It's not an impossible thing to do. This is a thing that has happened in the past, for example, around human cloning. The, the idea of the international community or scientific community coming together saying, hey, this technology seems like it has really big implications that we don't currently understand. Maybe we should think about it a bit longer. Has happened. It has happened. Human, clon human cloning being the greatest example mm -hmm. of this. But I was no, under no illusion that this would lead to that specifically. The main thing I like to get out of this letter, and the reason I supported it, is because it was about creating common knowledge that this is a thing that people care about. Before this time, it's this feels so long ago, but two or three years ago, you would talk to esteemed members of academia or of government or whatever, and you bring these problems and they're like, no one thinks that. Literally no one in the world actually yeah. thinks that. And I knew this wasn't true because I've talked to many respectable people about this topic that do think this is important. So this letter allowed us to create more common knowledge around, wait, this is actually a thing that serious people like Geoffrey Hinton, for example, or Joshua ben -Yu, do take seriously. And we should be having this discussion on a larger scale than we're currently it, it was a very extreme moment. I have to say, though, I will share you my experience of it. So I didn't sign the letter. I read it uh, quite carefully. Uh, and it made me think a little bit about the difference between Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and the environmental movements back in the 80s and 90s. So Greenpeace would go off and do these spectacular events that would be arresting, sometimes almost you know, verging on criminal or, or dangerous amongst other aspects, whereas Friends of the Earth would be more grassroots, sort of policy driven. And it felt to me like there was the a a aspect of that sort of stunt. And I remember I was doing something with Sam Altman last year and there were people with placards and demonstrating outside of outside of the venue where this was happened and I, happening. And I didn't really have that on my on my dance card at all. So your perspective back then was that you needed to do this in order to raise awareness and and, and kickstart the discussion. But what was the discussion you wanted to kickstart? There's a few things that go into this. We can talk about the, whether this is true or not in a second, but. The fact is there are people with a lot of money and a lot of power who currently are building technology that they themselves believe could kill literally every person on earth. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that whether I believe this or not, but they themselves believe this and mm -hmm. they are doing it. And a lot of very serious scientists and very serious people believe that this is a fair assessment. Mm -hmm. This is a big deal. And this is a big conversation. Who is giving these people the right to do something like this if it affects literally everybody. Do you think that people around the globe have consented to this experiment being run on them, on their families? The answer is no, they have not consented to this happening yeah. to them. So we can, can argue can about whether it's Can I pop, pop in there? Let me just pop in there because mm -hmm. I, I want to clarify one point that you're making, which I think is an important one. There isn't any scientific consensus by any means about that path uh, that, that you described about this technology potentially killing everyone. However, within the, disagree the, the disagreement, the disconsensus, there's a sufficient weight of people who feel that risk. And that 
is sufficient for that to be a moment of, of reflection, right? That we should pause and ask that question, which is certainly what I've done when I've had Joshua on the show and other people and, and have investigated this. So I definitely, I, I agree with that. And I think on your second point, which was about who gives you the right to do that? Where was the democratic accountable process that led there? I think there's some, there's, there is truth in that as well. It's also, of course, true about many of the technical systems that we live with today. It's true about the iPhone and the 375 notifications we get we get a day, right? These were not in any sense democratically um, assented to. They were, they were commercially, uh, we bought into a small aspect of it commercially and then much more was delivered over time. So does that idea of democratic consent also apply to wider questions of technology and innovation outside of AI, do you think? If we were a perfectly rational and co competent species with extremely sophisticated democratic infrastructure deployed across the entire planet, that would be awesome if we could do that. But in practice, this would be very difficult to do. It's not an either or, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So for example, I think you and me would just you say, if someone brings out a new piece of candy that doesn't only uses already approved ingredients, should they have to go through a massive democratic process to bring that on the market? Probably not. Should someone developing a new nuclear reactor have to go through some stringent supervised processes? Probably. Should someone be developing a new bioweapon, maybe just not be allowed to do that? Maybe. I think there's a spectrum here. Mm -hmm. And the question is, where does AI fall on the spectrum? Are there different types of AI? How do we separate these different types of AI? I think we would agree that an alpha fold is probably not the same risk as an actual human level AGI would be, and they should probably be regulated and handled in different ways. Mm. Yeah, I think this idea of the spectrum is again, very helpful. I, one of the things that I think about this issue with new technologies and, and the risks that they present is that we often co-evolve the safeguards that we need and that there is a sort of predator prey mechanic that that goes on and i think a little bit about cybersecurity. we go back to when i was first on the internet 1991 so 33 years ago and if someone had said to me in 30 years just one of the companies working on the internet will get 121 billion identity attacks on its network a year that's 4000 a second it would have been an outrageous idea. And yet that's exactly what happens on the Microsoft networks and did in, in 2023. And yet we can survive that. We couldn't have survived it in 91 or 92 or 95 or 2010 because we co-evolve the capabilities, the, the know-how, the operating practices, the automated systems, the testing alongside the development of, of these technologies. It, that's been the case. Isn't that also the case for this environment of, of AI systems? So the way I like to think about this is that, again, it's just not all technology is the same. And the risk profile and the development and so on of technologies is a fact about nature. It's not really a fact about ideology or policy. How dangerous nuclear weapons are is dependent on physics. How easy it is to build a nuke or how prevalent uranium are. These are facts about nature. These are not necessarily facts about our own ideology or our own politics. I think there's a similar situation here where, so Nick Bostrom, for example, calls these black ball technologies, is that you have an urn and there's maybe some blue balls and some red balls. And the blue ones are like nice technologies and the red ones are like difficult technologies. They have some downsides. And the question is, are there black ball technologies, technologies that are so dangerous that if we just pick them out, we die instantly. And this is a question about nature. This is not a question about ideology. This is not a question about libertarian versus statism. This is not a question about open source versus closed source. It's a question about nature. And it also depends on how fast these technologies are developed and how fast our immune system is to adapt them. I think you make really good examples, for example, in cybersecurity, is that there has been this co-development and it's been bumpy, but we've made a lot of progress. I think also iPhones and social media are also great examples of this. Mm -hmm. We're like, it sure has been bumpy so far. I don't think any of us would say, oh yeah, we did a great job with social networks. This right. is totally in hand. I don't think anyone would say that. No. But and, no, I think if we, for example, hypothetically develop no further social media for the next two generations, then I expect we would find ways to integrate them. We would or have our culture adapt, our legislation would adapt, our technology would adapt, and they would become more net positive for individuals' mental health and society as a whole and so on. But it takes time. So my claim of why I think AI, and specifically AGI, is 
like the lo- most likely technology we have seen so far, other than nuclear weapons instead of synthetic, synthetic bio, to be such a catastrophic technology. It's because the clock rate of our civilization has a kind of a fixed number. There's mm-hmm. a fixed speed of how fast people can adapt to things. Yeah. It's got it's still quite fast, all things considered. We can adapt within a couple of years or so if we need to. But that is a lot slower than how AI is moving. And if we, the usual intuition I have is just, if you build something that's smarter than all humans, it's better at politics, manipulation, deception, science, mm-hmm. business, everything else, and you don't know how to control it, by default, what do you think happens? For me, the argument goes the other way. Why would you expect this to go safe? This seems like something, at least it's synthetic bio human cloning. Yeah. It's like when we first thought of the idea of human cloning, it wasn't obvious this would be good or bad. Like maybe it is, but like we should really think about that. Yeah, I think that the argument that we cannot guarantee how an entity that is more powerful than us in this kind of in a key dimension will behave is a it's a reasonable one. I think it's hard to imagine outcomes that, that are, are different. And in, in natural systems, the process of uh, of evolution roughly keeps all of this in, in balance, right? There's no apex predator except those that have managed uh, to master technology uh, that isn't uh, kept in, in check from all of that. Now, I think that theoretically and logically that sits and makes sense. And it's But it's a bit to me like saying, imagine tomorrow super powerful aliens appeared over the planet Earth and had all of these attributes, right? That would be risky for us. That would be that could be risky for us and problematic for us. But but on the other hand, it doesn't feel like it is going to be tomorrow. It feels like even in at this pace of of, of development that we we are on, are going through, there is still coevolution of the defense mechanisms, the immune system, the understanding uh, that is happening alongside it. I'll give you an example. We just saw today the day we're recording this. This podcast in the last couple of days, ChatGPT started to give very funny responses to people and OpenAI has tried to make some kind of a fix. The thing is that happens in early versions of technologies. Is that a strategic systematic failure or is it like the square windows in the de Havilland Comet, the first commercial jetliner, which suffered from metal fatigue and there were 25 crashes, 500 people died, and then we learned not to put square windows into jetliners. In a sense, you, you get these things and ha- happen in, in early, uh, early days of technology. So how much do we actually read into a New York Times journalist persuaded, tried to nearly got persuaded to leave his partner because of a discussion with GPT 3.5 and turn that into a, a simple extrapolation that says, oh my God, and over here, we're hosed. Already, if we could agree on the, if AI existed that was so powerful and it emerged very quickly, this would be dangerous. I'm already pretty satisfied. And now we can talk about object level things. So then we can like this, the meta point I was making, I, I like to make is just to be, just to clarify is if AI of this power could emerge or would emerge very quickly, this is likely to be dangerous. This is the first thing. And then we can talk about, will it emerge quickly or not? Will it be powerful enough? And I think this is a great argument to have. I think this is- Yeah, a, and, I, this and is- I wrote this up in, in an essay that I called Existential Risks, Existential Problem, where I said that, look, I can imagine, I can logically see that it's possible for there to be agents more powerful than humans. Mm-hmm. And I can logically see they can be engineered. But the skepticism that I have or the path that I see is one of co-evolution over time with many points of intervention and development. And I found it very hard to get to paths where those don't emerge. So we'll mm-hmm. let's go and talk about those tangible bits in a second. But I did want to ask you a sort of particular question here, which is that what is the moment? Is there a breaking point or a signal that we would need to see, that you would need to see, that would say we're teetering on the, the precipice? Or is, is this, in your view, like the frog that doesn't can't tell that the water is getting warmer you could talk to your computer that was not the case four years ago if this was a sci-fi movie and you saw the protagonist suddenly see a thing he could talk to and it can explain quantum physics to them in shakespearean english on command and they're like this is no progress like four years that's fine would you think yeah this person is well calibrated and reasonable or does this look like a frog to you 
I think it's really, it's quite hard to know because we, we do live in a moment of time compression. In the 1980s, a sociologist called David Harvey, who's based in London, came up with this idea of time-space compression. And what he was describing was the intersection between technology and globalization that sees a constant compression. The way to think about this is the radius of the world gets shorter. When, when Abraham Lincoln was shot, it took 13 days for the British Prime Minister to learn of it. When Kennedy was shot, it was minutes. If Kim Kardashian trips, I get an Instagram notification. And you see this sense of, of compression. So what we, so is four years fast? It's fast in the context of going from writing to double entry bookkeeping, which was 3000 years. Even before AI, we are moving in a world that has the attributes of time space compression. And, and I'm not sure that AI is is actually exogenous to that. I don't think it is a new thing. It is actually part of the same pattern that we have observed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah, so this is a great example. So I like how you talk about like space-time compression, how this has been a trend for a very long time. You draw the exponential all the way back to thousands of years ago, if you want to. And so this reminds me of one of my greatest, one of my favorite anecdotes, where in the 20th century, there was born a Jewish-Polish nobleman named Alfred Korzybski. So Alfred Korzybski was thinking about technology, and he was seeing how technology was advancing very quickly in his times. And he thought logically that if technology continues on exponential, and our weapons and our bombs and everything gets exponentially more powerful, then in finite time, we're going to build things that are so powerful that they're going to blow up everything. At the same time, if our civilization is not getting better at handling these things and preventing both accidents and misuse of this technology, then in the long term, and not just in the long term, but like in the medium and short term, we are doomed. So Alfred Krzyzewski lived through World War I. And after World War I, he tried his best to create a art of rationality and like how to improve the human thinking and reasoning process in order to be more wise mm. and deal with these kind of things. He mostly failed, but it was yeah. an attempt. It was an attempt because it's really hard to do. Now, look, with the Krasinski example, let's give you, let's go come back with a different example. So I'm a child of the 70s. And so Paul Ehrlich's population bomb talked about the runaway population. It's Malthus version two. And at the same time you had, I was very influenced by the, the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth, which also talked about these exponential processes. And 60 years on, there was no population bomb. In many countries, there are not enough people and birth rates are declining because there were exogenous changes in, in values and behaviors. Uh, with the Limits to Growth, while we face a, an environmental crisis, it's not the one that the Limits to Growth was concerned with. They were concerned with, in a sense, running out of access to resources that we would need. And so we've surprised ourselves by not just, if not human resourcefulness, I think that is way too hubristic, but by what happens when the economic system combines with incentives, combines with innovation and research, combines with things that we were hard to predict, like how people's attitudes towards family might change and how interventions like the one-child policy might emerge. And those long-term prognostications about the sort of social impacts of these exponential processes were, were way off the mark. And so, so I, I guess I, I raise this as a way of, of saying that there's a very wide berth, right? This is almost like a, a chaotic system where small changes to the input take us to very different changes to the output. And I, and I guess the question maybe where people like me who are a little bit more, not so much relaxed, but I think the, the chance of the most extreme outcome is contingent on so many unlikely things happening that it's not quite a distraction, but a heading that way. And maybe other people who say those things are not as contingent as you think. Is that is that a reasonable way of, of framing it? I think it's a completely reasonable way to frame it. It's just for me, the unreason, the unlikely things are that it goes well. For me, it's convergent that things go poorly. In the limit of exponential growth, of exponential technology, whether it's semiconductors, GDP, whatever, and energy ability, the ability to destroy, to create, etc. The damage of the worst accident or misuse increases. 
And at some point, the blast radius of that, whether it's AGI or synth bio or super nukes or whatever, eventually the blast radius includes everybody. And if your civilization gets to that point where it has access to this technology, but it is not wise enough, it is not competent enough to either not build it or coordinate around literally zero accidents, which is very hard, then your civilization has a time limit. Now we can argue, maybe this time limit is still 100 years out. Maybe it's 1,000 years out. Sure, that's an object level argument, which I'm happy to have, by the way. I have some arguments I'm happy to have. There. <laughs> yeah. But on Common the meta point- not one to ever stand or stay away from an argument, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and on the meta point, but the meta point is that just we should, if we believe that technology advances and it advances greatly and that it is possible to build such technologies, we should expect them to be built at some point. And if they are built at that point and our civilization cannot handle them, we're in a bad spot. Now, if we have a thousand years of civilizational development before those technologies become viable, I would also be less concerned. I think there's very concrete reasons around why we should expect these technologies in the near future around semiconductors and like brains and comparing like chimps and humans and stuff like this. But at some point we have to go down to the inside view. We have to actually jump down to the object level if we want to actually like put yeah. numbers and like estimations on this. Case. I, I think what we'll do is it, we will get to, to, to some of the, the practical things that, that we can do. But I'm curious about this observation, right? You've said that you can talk to computers and they talk back. And, and I think many of us have had good experiences, practical experiences of doing that with the large language models. We also know that there are, there's incredible commercial demand to uh, use these things in enterprises, that models that are nearly as powerful as GPT-4 are available in open source, and they run on much less demanding hardware. In some sense, we're already well past the point of, of that was raised in the Paul's AI letter. So the old adage, you have to go to the to go to war with the army that you have, not the army that you want to have becomes very true. So Connor, what where we had got to, in a sense, was some points of, of agreement and some points of, of, of divergence. The point of divergence was really uh, about perhaps what is the pace with which we might get to very powerful technologies and what are the things that need to happen for us to get there without having good safeguards in place. And, and I think you and I have slightly different perspectives on that. But let's start with, with where we are where we are today, right? We have very powerful open source models that are nearly as good as GPT-4 when it comes to AI. There's a lot of corporate demand to implement these products in sales and customer service. This is where we are uh, today. So how do we turn this big safety agenda into practical things that can either be built as products or policies that can be implemented? So this is a great question. And of course, this will depend on how you personally think how close things are, how fast things will take off, et cetera. I tend to have very short timelines. Again, we'll, we can have the object level discussion about that later. So from my perspective, I actually do work on these problems concretely, both on the technological and on the policy side of things. So on the technological side, uh, for example, in my company, we work on something that we call cognitive emulation or COEM, which is a vision for how you can build LLM-like models that are extremely reliable, extremely auditable, extremely understandable by basically deconstructing larger cognitive tasks into smaller cognitive primitives and then training and building these models to be 100% reliable on these smaller tasks and then extremely reliable on composition. Mm -hmm. And so this way you can build up trees and longer reasoning things that have extremely high reliability yep. and they don't have the GPT-4 effect of you ask, you ask it to explain quantum physics in Shakespeare in English, works perfect. You ask it to calculate two minus two and it output zero. Yeah, and so the that so that's one approach. Maybe we'll get mm -hmm. some time to dig into it, which to me is in a way that, how do you construct reliably safe models that can be more deterministic and more more testable and this hierarchical approach that you've taken it does remind me a little bit of the sort of semantic ontologies of good old-fashioned ai mm -hmm. where where people try to map all of the world knowledge in a way in these relationships that ai systems would try to walk their way across so that so one mm -hmm. approach is that you go out and you build a better architecture which then has mm -hmm. to be in a way adopted, right? It has yes. to be adopted but across the, the economy. It doesn't address, of course, being done in open source or the work being done in in labs, in countries that, that we, yeah. we can't necessarily control. What about the policy side? What are the key policy things? 
So on the policy side, <laughs> that's the hard one, isn't it? I'm a technologist at heart. I love technology. I love working on technology. But you've been in many, you've been in the House of Lords. You've spoken to politicians. I think you, you, have a, you moonlight with a second career. Yes, I, I do. They unfortunately forced me to wear a suit. It's a true tragedy. So, yeah, a couple of years ago, even, I was very much not interested or like uh, very not, I just didn't understand this part of the world and like how it works. Typical over, overconfident engineer, young engineer. And I now really understand how much of really the problem of AI, of civilization, of technology, it's a social problem. It's a political problem. It's not, there are technical components to this problem. And these technical components are very important. Like having a viable alternative, which is safer, makes the political process much easier than saying no more stuff. You can't stuff. have it at all. Yeah, can't have it at all. It's much more politically viable to say, okay, here's a technology which is as good or better, and we just need to enforce it. This is a much better, much more feasible direction. But this is, it's very important to understand also for all the you know, technical viewers out there, is that this is not a technical problem. This is a civilizational problem. So on the policy side... What, what... By a civilizational problem rather than a social problem or a technical problem. I guess it's all. So what I mean by this is that if we think of civilization as an entity, as, as a thing that can make decisions, the entity that can make the decision to, that is powerful enough to make the decision of make the future go well is civilization. I don't think it's any individual country. I don't think it's any individual person. If it's, those individuals can affect larger coordination and larger entities and so on. But ultimately, if we develop ways to build, say, open source AGI, that is super dangerous and we need to prevent that. But doing that is very hard and it requires coordination on a civilizational scale. And like just one European country banning it is not sufficient. It, you're going to need to get America on board. You're going to get China on board. You're going to need enforcement, something, right? I'm not saying I have a solution to this problem. What I'm saying is this is the level of difficulty that we face is that even if it's not AI, even if it's some other technology. Maybe people would call that perhaps global governance, right? Rather than civilization. Sure. And, and, I, and I think I'd slightly maybe frame the idea of where civilization heads is not a, or where uh, human society heads is, is not really a directed process, right? It's a process of spontaneous order. I think there are some similarities. Two of them are an increasing use of energy usefully uh, to be applied. There are no well-developed countries in the world that are energy poor. And conversely, there are no energy poor countries that have really great social, economic, demographic outcomes. And the other frame really is that you see a, a, across the longitudinal data is the ability for uh, an, an entity, a political entity or an economic entity to apply information increases as those entities become more complex and sophisticated. The use of information within an information processing, so the computers below it, within the US economy of 2023 is far ahead of where it was in 1875. And that seems to be a, a trajectory. And, and those two things, I think, are, the, are two things that we see really with a great degree of co commonality. You don't even see resource usage always going up. Because if you go to a country like Denmark, which started to move towards recycling and reuse and renewables and energy efficiency about 20 years ago, their resource usage per capita and per sort of dollar of GDP is, is going down. And so is their energy usage and similar things are happening in, in the UK. So even resource usage is, is something that we can apply energy and information to to reduce. So I would say that if we think about the direction of travel of societies in aggregate, it's about how they exploit energy and information to deliver spontaneously rather than in a directed way. But maybe you think there's a directed component to it as well. I think there's a lot of good directed components to this. Why did Western countries develop far more than other countries did? I think the reasons for this are not just, oh, America had more coal, like they had more energy. I don't think that explains. I think this is a correlation with what actually happened. A massive amount of civilizational progress is cultural. It's about memetics, it's about institutions, it's about mm -hmm. rule of law, it's about having the right structures in place to allow free trade, to allow not having roving bands of people stealing stuff or like causing damage or whatever, warlords and the like. So it would be, so there is a massive social component and social technical component to what makes things. So if you observe that what prosperous or good 
countries that you like to live in tend to use more energy or use more information. This doesn't answer the question of what makes a country use more energy? What makes a country process information better? And the answer to like, how does a country process information better is quite complicated. This is a question that massive amounts of social scientists try to answer all the time, and it's very hard. It's a lot to do with laws and institutions and cultural norms, cultural trust between individual people, trust in institutions, trust in many things like this. So I don't think this is random, but it's pretty clear. If you have a war or not a war, the not war situation tends to be better. And if you can do things to move yourself in that direction, this is generally a good thing to do. So let's come to this idea of grand global challenges. You call them civilizational challenges. Those are very difficult. So we have achieved that in the past once or twice. But let's just play the game of practicality, that it's going to be really hard to get every person to agree around a table, including dark labs and, and, and so on. So what are the practical things that, that we can implement? One thing that I, I saw in the Biden XO executive order was the idea of putting a, not quite a cap, but a soft limit on the amount of processing that could be done to build certain types of foundation models. It's a lower limit if it's using biological data. Uh, and that limit was, was in a sense, semi-arbitrary. It was just higher than what people thought had been used for GPT-4. What's quite nice about that in terms of implementation is that compute is physically manifested, right? It's manifested in energy consumption, in data centers, in chips, in supply chains. So it is something that is traceable and frankly, interceptable. Is that the kind of thing that that can be a, a sort of, could start to become a helpful, a helpful policy? Yeah, I absolutely think that compute governments, compute regulation is the obvious way you get moratoria in a way that are sensible. And so maybe on the meta point here is like when I think about regulation and I think about coordination, I like to think about my kind of rule of thumb is how do you do great things in the world? Like how do you achieve humongous things in the world? And for me, you have to do two things to accomplish humongous things in the world. The first thing is do things that compound. And the second thing is don't die. If you do those two things, you can accomplish incredible things. So for me, stuff like compute caps, moratoria, et cetera, are on the don't die category. They buy us time to build things that compound, to build better institutions, to understand how difficult these problems are, to understand how to build academic knowledge, to build diplomatic capital between countries, to work on these kind of problems, to build common right. knowledge and so on. So where we stand right now, I think, is quite a healthy place because there's only a handful of companies that have the resources to buy the compute. There is all of the smaller firms are struggling to find the capital to even rent compute. And the essentially the, the bulk of this is happening in the US because China can't get access to uh, the, the very high end. So you've bought a couple of years of control there. And in a way, if what we're talking about is Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft OpenAI, we're down to four or five entities that have in a sense, reputations and care about in a set, care about the future. So that feels like it's a reasonably easy thing to to implement, right? Because if we implement a compute cap, it's not as if Doctor Evil can find one trillion dollars and buy all mm -hmm. of the GPUs, right? We'd figure it out, right? The U.S. government figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, I, and it wouldn't so, even be able to find the engineers to work with him. So the compute mm -hmm. cap seems like actually that does buy quite a bit of time. Yes. I think this is exactly correct. This is why I think, and this is also part of why I signed the moratorium letter, is a lot of people said this is impossible to implement even, even if people were on board with it. I don't think this is true. I think this was a political problem. This is not an implementation problem. As you exactly said very correctly, the, the supply line on high-end semiconductors is extremely tight. There, there may be like one company using the tools from one other company with the designs from one third company. And there's four or five companies who can use the semiconductors properly. And they're all located in like Western law-abiding countries. If the U.S. government told Microsoft, don't do X or we will sue you, they will comply. Like people, especially I feel like tech nerds sometimes have this like utopian or like badass view of like how people like the market, they don't care about the government. This is just not true. Like their lawyers tell them, shut, the, shut everything down and they will. So we do have law abiding companies that can be reasoned with and that can be made to yeah. agree. To these yeah, I, but now let's throw a wrinkle in all of this. So compute is exponentiating. And every in the old Moore's law drumbeat, it was a 60% improvement for, per dollar every year. And with GPUs, it's much, much faster than that. And we're seeing novel architectures 
emerge that are not popular in the market uh, yet, but they are alternatives to GPUs. Even if you saw doubling every every couple of years, within eight years, that's eight. We're at, at a 10x, and we're much much closer. Right, the threshold that you have that you're worried about, and at the same time, what we're learning is, and this is true with any technology, right? The first engine, car engine that were built were really poor efficiency and very noisy. And then we just discovered how to improve that efficiency over learning up to the limit of the, the Carnot cycle. So you've got these two things happening, right? Smaller models start to work really well and computers becoming more widely available. That tide is rising, right? Up to your berm. Yep. So the other thing that, that strikes me about, about some of these uh, issues is that compute does buy a certain amount of, a certain amount of time. But when we look at these quite complex problems, there's rarely a silver bullet. And I think that was part of the maturation of the AI safety community over the last 10 or 15 years has been a move from silver bullets. Oh, if we could find that alignment algorithm inspired by Asimov, we'd, we'd fit it, put it into every one of these positronic brains and it would be the thing would be safe. And you got people like Bostrom coming up with all the loopholes and then people trying to figure out theoretically if they could deliver them and, and they didn't deliver it, right? They weren't able to and it becomes increasingly clear that maybe the problem's framed in the wrong way or it's just mathematically not tractable. So it's really about how do you construct the layers? There's a Swiss cheese model of safety that, that allow this technology to be available sa safely. And also how do you build the systems or incentivize the creation of the systems that allow for these things to maintain some sort of safety equilibrium. You've talked about what maybe one layer of the Swiss cheese, which is a kind of compute cap. What are the other, maybe other three practical things that are politically viable that, that would still work in a leaky environment where you can't get everyone in every nation to agree and are you know, economically tractable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first of all, there are no three such things that have all those properties that save us. There <laughs> right. is, there are no three things that are economically completely harmless, politically completely feasible, have no downsides whatsoever, and that also save you. There is no such oh, thing. Conor, I'm <laughs> going to say you've not been a CEO long enough because experienced CEOs know that they can stand and yell at their product teams and say, I want it all. I will yeah, that, have no trade-offs. That's definitely how it works. That's how a good CEO <laughs> runs a company. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. So we'll yeah. come back. So there are no yeah. things that give you all... Yes three but let's let's yes. talk through like your yeah. three next favorite let's ensure mm -hmm. they're practical so i will insist on sort of practicality rather i will than optimize for practicality yeah i will optimize for practicality so the first thing i think which i do think is actually a practical even so huh, men do a lot of people not like it is liability liability right. is one of the greatest cut forms of law we have i think it's great is that if you create an externality if you create a risk you pay for it this yeah. is what it fundamentally means. And I think there well, should what's, be... what's powerful about liability and, and externalities is that it's politically acceptable to the left and the right, because yeah. for the right, it's like it's polluter pays. It makes sense. We're, we're, we're making sure the market works well. So where what mm -hmm. does liability mean in the context of, say, large language model that is embedded in a consumer app? What, what, what does that mean? So I think fundamentally we need strict liability for model developers. And so the reason is, is that in the general theory of liability law, the best practices, you're supposed to put liability for safety externalities to the, to the actor, which has the best resources to address that risk. This is general best practice. For example, in the 70s and 60s, um, car manufacturers fought very hard to not include seatbelts in their cars because they argued it's the user's fault if they get into an accident. It's not our fault. And, but of course, having every single user have to build their own seatbelts is much less feasible than just having the people who have the factories, who have the resources to develop and install safe seatbelts do. Now it is the case that if you have a faulty seatbelt, the car manufacturer is absolutely liable. That doesn't mean they're liable for all possible scenarios, right? The user is sufficiently dumb and they did their due diligence to generate off the hook. I think we need a similar thing for AI developers is that Look, if you're building, say, I don't know, you're building an audio generating AI system and you can't ensure that it can't be used to clone people's voices for fraud, then tough luck. You don't get to put it on the market. Like you, you, if you can't pay for the externalities, 
well, you better find out. And so the main feed pushback you get from developers here is they're like, oh, but we can't make them sick. We don't know how to do this. And I'm like, great. Then liability is even more important because that would create the economic incentive for people to actually do the research, for actually to figure out at the moment, we are, have this huge unpriced externality where all these people can develop open large language models or voice cloning or whatever. And it has all these tangible externalities upon society and they're being p paid by society. So my, I hope for the left and right acceptable answers, if you loot, you pay. Let's dig into this example with the voice cloning. So would you be satisfied in a, with a framework that says the person who generated the fake is the one liable and if the provider can't identify that person then the liability falls on them that's similar to in financial services right that's why we go through you know kyc and, and aml processes right if i've gone through the process that creates a shield for me as the operator and it's put it's pushed to the end user i think it's definitely a good direction it would definitely be much better i would go even farther than this personally like I would say they're both liable, no matter what. This is much stricter than in, this is usually this kind of strict liability exists only in relatively high security applications or like high reliability stuff. I think there's also liability law. There's this concept of like unusually dangerous activity or like you're dealing with some kind of technology or system or whatever that is unusually dangerous in some sense. And in that case, you're always liable, even if you did all reasonable security precautions. I think that AGI in particular is an unusually dangerous technology. Mm -hmm. But for example, for post cloning, if we just had strongly enforced KYC, yeah, I think that would be a massive improvement over what we currently have. We had this situation recently where state-backed actors using chat GPT to draft phishing emails. So what, what happens in that case? From my perspective, I would believe that they should be liable for harms caused by those groups. Is being, I'm not, uh, they being? OpenAI. OpenAI. Yes. So I'm not, I don't know if there are laws that criminalize this. Is it forbidden to provide services to hostile foreign actors? I don't know. But, or to aid them. If I flew over to China, I was in the office with the people and I did the thing that chat GPT did, would I have committed a crime? If so, I think OpenAI should have also been charged with this crime. I'm not a lawyer, but I hear where you're going. I think the idea of, of liability laws, it's a well-established body of law, and many industries face those types of types of concerns. I think one thing that has happened with within the tech industry has been that it emerged at a time of deep under-regulation, and it emerged out of uh, a privileged kind of close set of military contracts in California. And in the 70s and um, late 70s, early 80s, we were in the bonfire of regulations. And no, there was no political capital really to go in and start to construct regulations of that type. And in a way, it's hard to run the social experiment to say, would we have better technology had we regulated it? What I remember from the, the 90s was it was very confused because on the one hand, you'd had the FCC decree on allowing radio stations not to be fair and balanced and TV channels with their news, which is a, a kind of odd commercial decision. And on the other hand, you had a, a moral panic about adult TV content over digital cable channels and people wanting to put what it was called the clipper chip, right, into TVs to prevent people accessing information. And the thing that struck me about those regulatory interventions was that they were really about moral and cultural control rather than the types of, of risks that you, say, get with pharmaceuticals or you get in financial services. Now, those to me are two industries which are very heavily regulated and have probably done quite well as a consequence of that regulation. So I think we do have examples, quite strong examples, where a little bit of the right regulation has really helped those industries be useful and beneficial. So if we come back to this sort of list of things that are practical. So one is, one is liability. So one is effectively saying that going down the chain, there is a chain of liability which will force up a user or a provider to take additional steps to uh, make sure that, that sort of use is, is facilitated well. Um, and then we can discuss where that should end. Should it end with the, should it end with the, the, the user? Should it be passed to the provider if the provider took reasonable steps to identify the user? 
properly? What other things do you think should be on the agenda? So other things, optimizing for feasibility. The yes. next thing I would put on the list of feasible things would be uh, a global kill switch. And so this is not a literal switch. It is more a protocol that if, say, N of K or K of N nations decide to activate this protocol, a message gets sent out to all Frontier model developers, and they have to shut down all their public-facing AI things within five minutes. Otherwise, they get hit by a huge fine. So the reason I want this is not because this would like necessarily help if AGI is on the loose. If we're at that point, it's already call a day, have a drink, have a smoke a cigar. But the reason this is useful is because I am not confident that at this moment, if you were even the CEO of Google, could you shut down Google, even hypothetically? I'm not sure you could. Who would you call? Who would be in charge of that? Do you even know where all the servers are? It, these systems are so complicated and they're so ingrained in so many different things. It's very hard to know where and everything is. So this protocol is useful because it makes things legible. It forces okay. you to have I'm a I'm going to stand up against that one for two reasons. I'm going to stand up against it for political feasibility to get that degree of agreement, and I'll stand up against it against technical feasibility. Partly the technical feasibility is exactly that, right? Who actually runs a company and what are the things that you can get it to do or not do? But the second is that this technical infrastructure is designed to be resilient and robust because we want our hospitals being able to access their cloud records, EHRs, 24 hours a day, and even if there's a power cut. And the third is that the systems are really terrifically complex at a network level. When you go into a data center, they are, while they're built up of units, they are quite, quite organic. And it's not really clear how you would do that. I remember when we started to move to, to cloud, people were amazed at the rate of hard drive failures that Amazon had in AWS. And yet the system stayed up because you just knew you were going to get fa failures. You made it resilient. So I will, I'll disagree on the feasibility. Oh. On its political feasibility, I think you're correct that it's very unpopular within tech people, but it is very legible to policymakers. This is a thing that makes sense to them. This is a thing they would want. It's a thing that if you do a KFN kind of thing, is you can get even hostile people on board with it potentially. Not means it's easy, it's just possible. On the second, on the technical point, you basically articulated why I think it's good, is that no one is going to pay the cost to make your systems legible and controllable if not everyone else is forced to do it too. It's extremely expensive to make these high-end, powerful distributed systems legible and controllable, which is exactly why the government has to ensure that people do it, because otherwise it won't happen. Let's get on to your third one. So the third one is not exactly a policy, but I think it's a global, it is maybe the most important. I said, no, it's, this is the most important of all of them. It's just, I want everyone in the world to know this is a thing. I want every single person in the world to just know that what is happening, that this is a thing that affect them, and that they can and should have an opinion on this. I just want, I've been very heartened. One of the things that really gives me hope is that I talk to normal people about this, and they actually have good intuitions around this. They have the intuition of, wow, we're making things that are smarter than us. That seems dangerous. Are we being careful with that? Who's in charge of that? What Are we sure about that? So yeah. my... My impression has been that it's only tech people and elites that don't instantly think, whoa, we should be slow. We should be careful on that. That seems like, you know, that. why would that go well? That seems really dangerous. So I would love if just the whole world, not just tech people and elites had a say in this and were able to think about this because this is something that affects them. Yeah, I, so I think that there is a way, there's a mechanism for that. And I've spoken to a number of people about this over the last few years, which is how do you tackle complex technical or scientific questions that have significant societal implications. And we've had a couple of great examples. One is in Ireland when they had a constitutional referendum on abortion rights and another in France where there was discussion about euthanasia and whether uh, euthanasia could be legalized. And the mechanism that they used there to evince human values and perspectives and the key real fault lines, not the fault lines of the spoken like you or I, but the ones that society, those societies had was that of the citizens jury or the citizens assembly. And that is an expert driven deliberative process that has been used for the last few decades, increasingly more, more and more. And it is really good at identifying these things because you made a, a, a number of contentions there about how you think ordinary people f feel when they hear this. And that's probably from your experience, 
of walking around and talking to them, but having perhaps presented your ideas. And I've had also you go polls, but yes. But, but I, so I'm very skeptical about polling for these types of issues because I've observed them over technical issues for, for 30 years. But I do think that a process of a global process of national and sub-regional citizens assemblies to evince these values, identify differences in regions, identify differences in demographics and kind of cultural styles, which can be done, these are not hugely expensive, is one way of taking the, the temperature in a way that I think is incredibly pro-social. Pro now, I, the thing about this is I think it's, I love it. And I've talked to people who build citizens assemblies and have done it for Macron and for, I've talked to some of the, the sort of big AI deep learning masters on, on this subject is that there's a lot of political elite, elite resistance, right? Because they feel they've been elected and they should make their decisions their way. So what have we done today? We have, we've talked about the risks. We've talked about how you think about how risks from AI evolve and emerge. We've identified some points of commonality between us and some points of, of disagreement. We touched earlier on some things that your company was doing practically. And I'd love to talk a little bit about, about the sort of practical side of AI. So let's stay within the realm of it being safe for the time being. What are the things that have got you excited about for, in the technology, the applications that you've seen people use that make you think, oh, I'm glad we're going down this route? Yeah, so I there's many things about the AI that I, and general AI progress that I love. I am I love technology at heart. I've always been a hacker, techno optimist, and so on my whole life, and that and my heart has not changed. I, the biggest one, of course, is always AI for science. I, right. Every time I see a cool app, your alpha folds and your like physics experiments and stuff, that's all just so cool. Or like AIs for proof automation. I'm so excited about AI for proof automation. It's so cool. Um, now, you got excited there. <laughs> just explain to a, a, a non-technical listener what a proof automation is and why it matters. Ah, so why it matters is a complicated question, but okay. I can explain Tell what, us it, what is. it is. Then. Um, so in mathematics, you want to often prove that certain things are true, and this is really tricky. Sometimes you have to write what's are, what are called proofs, and these proofs can be very long and very complicated, and they're very rigid. And so a lot of this is creativity on this on genius on the part of mathematicians, where they'll look at a certain thing and that, and then come up with a brilliant way of proving that thing. And sometimes it's just route. You just have to do a lot of steps and it's just a process, but sometimes also like big creativity. And so recently there's been a lot of progress on using AI systems to suggest such routes to proving mm -hmm. novel mathematical things, proving things about programs and so on. And I'm interested in this for many reasons. I think this is very exciting, but. Yeah, I can see that's th why that matters. Um, okay, so I stopped you at uh, <laughs> w you, the, the, the examples that you're excited about. Let's have some more. I'll share one with you that I have seen that I, found really interesting. It's more prosaic, it's more applied, but it's a company that uses a series of compound number of uh, large language models to help doctors get their notes transcribed and structured and identify the actions they need to take, whether it's order the test or write a prescription. Um, and it, it, it's pretty safe. Um, it, it tests well. Uh, and Tens of thousands of doctors are, are using it, and some of the feedback is it saves them an hour and a half uh, a day, which is you know quite a good thing. It's more time with patients, it's more time to to reflect, it's more time to to do professional development or just relax. So I'm quite excited about that. It's very prosaic. It's not as highfalutin as AI proof automation, but I'd love to hear a couple more from you. Yeah, man, there's just so much that I really love about AI and so much you can do. This is not much less clearly pure good, but like a lot of the run of creative applications, assistance for writing, visual media, and stuff like this. I think there's a lot of downsides here as well, unfortunately, with deep fakes and so on. And like just artists losing jobs, I think is a real problem. I love artists. A lot of my family are artists and it's really heartbreaking. Some of the stuff that's happened to some of these people, and I don't know how to solve this. So it always feels bad whenever I use it for my D and D campaign to help me illustrate the scene, and I feel really bad about it. Yeah, but yeah, that's more. You, there's an interesting observation there because I have a slightly different experience on that. So I found a a great DJing app called DJ Studio, 
And uh, DJ Studio is a mixing app. It's going to compete with Recordbox and Serato and all these others. But it's made for people who have no idea what they're doing, like, like me. And in it, it has, I think, what today we would call AI. It's got a bunch of algorithms that help you select your tracks very well, compose them, and put together the first draft of what a transition, a mix from one track to the next would be. And uh, you can go and listen to my mix cloud. We'll put it in the show notes afterwards. And what's been fantastic is that it's allowed me to create my mixes. I, once I, once the AI does its thing, which takes it, you know, looks at a billion combinations, it takes it like a minute on my MacBook. I will then spend two or three hours, right? Tweaking, changing, completely disagreeing, scoring out, putting the different track in and changing the transition. And now I've become, I've got a lot out of it. But the, the other thing that's happened is that I've now really become fascinated by real DJs and I'm starting to follow them and listen to their Instagrams and their YouTubes and just really pay attention to the art that they practice. And it has been for me a, a gateway drug, not to DJ myself, which I'm doing using this app and enjoying it, but actually into appreciating the real creators with the talent. And, and I wonder whether that is a is that something that can replicate across the piece? I don't know, but I also think that these tools can help build an appreciation for cultural practice. I think this is true to some degree, but we got to be honest here. A lot of artists are going to be out of job real soon. Like, it's just a fact. Like, it's an economic factor. Maybe more people will appreciate the fineness of anime girls or whatever, but... The truth of the matter is there's a lot of people who currently draw anime girls for a living or do concept art or whatever who are not going to have a job because it's just too expensive. Have you, I've paid professional artists before for like hobby projects and stuff. And yeah. it's expensive. Like it's rightfully expensive, but I think there is a, there's a, another thing that goes on in here and you're completely familiar with the lump of labor fallacy and, and so on. And the, the fact that markets, there isn't a fixed amount of work and that markets expand. And so the, if you look at animation, the ratio of, hours of footage to people employed has really moved in favor of more hours of footage per, per animator from where we were with Steamboat Willie and, and Snow White. We get the computer to interpolate. We have primitives that we can drag and drop. And the that's been ma matched by an expansion in the consumption of this material. So we may see in the short term a, a bit of a shock. A number of these artists are, are making money through on the side as well, right? Through the Upwork channel, which is not their art, it's their money making and that gets cut quite quickly and can be very painful. But the other part is how do these tools then become part of the repertoire as they have in, in some cases? And what we've seen historically is, and I know what you're gonna say, <laughs> but I'll let you say it. What we've seen historically is that new forms have emerged and markets have expanded. Go on, hit me with it, Connor. <laughs> It's it's true historically ready. until it's not at some point there will truly be no more labor left like this is the whole accelerationist argument goes all the way back to nick land is that yeah. if you keep expanding capital it is always capital consumes more and more you need less and less labor and eventually labor becomes capital becomes labor which is what ai is ai we're, is we're 100 yeah. substitutable that is a, that is a big grand topic for another time i want to come back to uh, just one last section which is really about what your the core heart of your work is which is can we build safe advanced ai and and just in that last 10 minutes let's just explore the the steps that we take right you've talked a bit about slowing some things down with the compute cap you've talked about disincentivizing unnecessary bad behavior through liability frameworks and through other tools that we didn't get a chance to, to speak about on, on on the podcast so we we've put that sort of exogenous external scaffolding right that that is is there uh to to give us a bit of a framework but at its heart we need to build the thing that is safe. So could, could you break that down re really simply? At some point, somehow, we need to have some structure, cultural, institutional, technological, whatever, that can exist into the future, fulfill our values, give us the things we want in life, and be stable enough to not decay into something worse. This is a very high ask. This is a very complicated thing we're asking for because humans want a lot of things. 
that aren't optimal. I'm sure you love your kids and you like going, I don't know, whatever your hobbies are, reading books or going for long walks or whatever. That's not economically efficient. It would be much better if you just threw away all that stuff and you worked instead. And at the moment, the reason this doesn't happen is because if you do that to humans, they break and then they become even less economically productive. So we pay them to go on vacation and somewhat, you know, yeah. at least in the ideal case. This will not be true once we have AI systems. This safety mechanism that's currently there is not stable. Once we have more advanced technology, you can abuse robots as much as you want. There's no reason to give them time off ever. They're cheaper than humans. There's no reason to pay for human happiness in this scenario. Yeah. But so this is, so I, what I would say here is this is a, this is an argument about economic welfare, right? That emerges that I, I will I bring you back at some point and we'll have this discussion. Let's go to the technological safety side dimension, mm -hmm. right? The, the technological framing, right? We hear that large language models are inherently hard to control. They're, they're, they're sort of thrown together and then you try to, nurse them into safety. And some people say, uh, actually, they're pretty well aligned. In fact, we should recognize how far we've gone. And others, other, others say that they aren't and they're not provably safe. And, and many of my guests uh, my, uh, have, have, have said that. So let, let's go into the technological side of it. Can we, what are the steps to building that provably safe and aligned AI? So if you want to build a provably safe system, which is what we would do if our civilization was truly wise, you're Man. wise, uh, Connor, so let's hear what you yeah. would do. The first thing we need to do is to purely technical. So I'm not talking about the social side that would enable yeah. this thing. So like the closest I have found to a reasonable, to a semi-reasonable proposal for how this would work would be David Dalrymple's proposal with the AI, UK AI task force. And he has this really complicated proposal about how you create these formal, provable world models on top of distributed, checkable systems to model the whole world. And you create proofs about action plans on top of proof systems, et cetera, et cetera. I've talked to David before. He's literally the smartest person I've ever met in my life, I think, uh, like raw IQ wise. I Wait, don't oh, think sorry. it's- Don't be rude to the host, Connor. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, second. <laughs> and he, but to do this thing is really hard. To do this, we need much more advanced mathematics. Like the, like you can ask him about this, like the levels of a category theory and so on that we just haven't even mm -hmm. yet invented. We need far more advanced, far more usable, uh, provable like uh, tools. Like the best we have right now is a French tool called Coq. Um, that's literally what it's called. And uh, which is a wonderful French pun, I am told. Um, and it's a, it's terrible, but all the other ones are worse. And it's a very clunky, it's a very expensive to use and so on. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to improve there. We need much better software engineering. There. Then we also need massive advances on learning theory, representation theory, thing like, like our current state of like learning theory as in what do things learn in various assumptions and so on is, you know, again, no offense to all the great learning theorists out there. It's really bad. Like we barely understand anything about even two layer neural networks. This needs to get way better than this. We need to, the construction of a safe AGI, a safe and aligned AGI system is a civilization plus level project. This is a demigod tier project. This is something of such like a hundred X bigger than the Manhattan project. And this will involve not just the technical side, it will also have the social side and the philosophical side. Because eventually you get to the problem, okay, you're building the world model. Cool. It's all provable. It's all checkable. Now, what does it do? What do you tell it to do? What does it mean to do good? Yeah. The truth, like Nick Bostrom. Uh, but let, let me, I, I think there's something quite interesting in, in this part, part, path, right? So the two things that are quite interesting. The first is that it sounds like, and you're not the only one who says we need, there's more science and maths that's required here and research that's, re, that's required. But it, it also sounds like those are a bit like the, th the key things that we need to develop powerful AI full stop. That, that the same things that provide the, this sort of safety and provability are the things that w one would want to have and to know how to apply in order to construct a powerful AI system, right? Because a really powerful AI system needs to have a world model. It needs to have ways of representing the world in, internally and um, a sense of physics that is not simply driven by 2D physics, uh, sorry, sorry, 2D pixels. Uh, and, and in a way that those things, which seem to be the path towards very powerful AI, if you say we also need them for safe AI, 
then that's the same journey, right? That's the same road. I wish it was. If it was, I wouldn't be, I, I, I don't think we would be in danger. It's the other way around. The things that lead you to safe AGI also lead you to unsafe AGI. And things that lead you to unsafe AGI don't necessarily lead you to safe AGI. A matter of fact is, which is, again, a fact about reality. This is a fact about physics, not a fact about anything else, is that if you train big neural networks on a bunch of shit, they learn world models. And it doesn't mean these are legible world models. It's not world models we can do proofs over necessarily. I think it is much easier to build something that is as smart or smarter than a human by doing evolution or just like randomly sla slapping things together as hitting it with RL than it is to build something which is practice, that is like provable, that is well factored, that is well bug tested. There's so many bugs in like our current deployments. Have you ever seen a like training code base for a large language model. It's some of the most horrific things you'll ever see in your life. Like it's a nightmare. <laughs> it, it's so like these distribute or like these CUDA blobs that you use for like your like various kernels and whatever. It's a nightmare. So like when I'm talking about a provable system, I'm talking about this is a thing where if you turn it on, you have a 100% confidence that GG well played. Credits roll, we did it. Everything is going to go well forever. This is an extremely hard thing to build. And this is not what we're going to build by default. It's much easier to build a schizophrenic, smart, but like messy biological thing that goes rogue than it is something that is a perfectly mathematical angel. Yeah. Okay. I can, I hear that. Now I noticed that we are coming to the top of time. And what I want to, to do is think about the people who listen to this last minute of the show. They're the most loyal. If we were to have a conversation in one year's time, what are the things that you would like us to be practically talking about if we were on a path that would keep you happy? If we were on a good path, we would be extremely serious and advanced on actually moratorium, or at least so around some forms of AI development, such as autonomous agents or like frontier models. And we would actually be, have serious teeth about that. We would be having a more nuanced discussion around open source. Currently, the, the discussion around open source is very binary. It's very ideological driven. It's all open source or nothing. I hope we can move to a point where we're much more nuanced about this. And we're like some things, but maybe not others. We would be in a spot where we're seriously considering being like, wait, no, maybe we shouldn't build AGI until we're ready for it. Whether we agree on this or not, at least we're having the discussion. Should we be attempting this at all at this point in time? Maybe we should, Like, but this conversation should happen. Are we even in a spot where we as a civilization should want to try? Or should we tr maybe uh, solve some other problems first or get more confident before we give it a shot? There's a bunch of companies. They're getting a lot of funding right now in the Bay Area. It was their primary goal, written black on white, is to build AGI. And I think we as a civilization should ask ourselves the question, is this the right time for that? Those are three things that we should look out for. February 2025. I'm certain we'll all still be here. Connor, thank you so much for taking the time. A real pleasure. Thank you so much.